It's time for the 1430 Connection on 1430 WNAV and 99.9 FM. Spotlighting news, newsmakers, and important community issues. Now, with this week's edition of the 1430 Connection, here is WNAV news anchor Donna Cole. Welcome to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me is Jane Burgess. She's a wildlife technician with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Jane, thank you for joining me today. Happy to be here. I'm calling this show the Wildlife Fact and Fiction Show. And the reason is we are right on the edge of spring here in Maryland. And in spring, we see a lot more wildlife than we had during the sleepy winter. Yes. That's right. <laughs> and there are some good rules that we should know. For instance, let's start with things like raccoons and foxes and possums and groundhogs mm-hmm. that you're going to see out more. All the furry critters. <laughs> yeah. And why is that? Why do we see them out more during the spring? You may not be seeing them out more during the spring than you did during the winter, especially since we had such a warm winter. But we're getting into their breeding season, so you certainly may be seeing them out with their young, uh, which definitely isn't cause for alarm as long as they're left alone. So a lot of people think that raccoons, especially raccoons and foxes, you shouldn't be seeing them out there. I hear this all the time. I see it on our neighborhood Facebook group. We see a fox. We're calling Department of Natural Resources. It shouldn't Mm -hmm. be out during the day it has rabies and Every time I see these posts come up, no, no, it's okay, yes. Right. Um, So it's actually perfectly natural for a raccoon or a fox to be out during the day. They tend to be nocturnal. For example, foxes love to hunt squirrels. Squirrels are only active during the day, so if they want to catch one, they have to be out during the day, too. Right, and they're feeding their family. Exactly. So you don't want to take them away from the wild when they're feeding Mm -hmm. their family. And rabies is generally kind of easy to see in an animal, yeah? Not always. The first stage where an animal is actually capable of spreading rabies, it shows no symptoms whatsoever. Okay. So that phase lasts for about a week. And then the week after that, you're going to start seeing it look disoriented, stumbling. It might lose control of its hindquarters. Sometimes it's aggressive and foaming at the mouth, but not usually. So that's why the general advice is hands off, whether it's acting strangely or not. And if you see an animal acting strangely, what do you do? The number for the Maryland uh, USDA Nuisance Wildlife Information Line, it's 1-877-463-6497. That's available Monday through Friday, uh, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. It's only available to toll-free to Maryland phone numbers, so make sure you're calling from a Maryland area code. Okay, now uh, for Saturday and Sunday, if somebody does see an animal acting funny... I would advise calling the Department of Natural Resources Communication Center. That's a 24-hour, seven days a week communications line for the Natural Resources Police. They can give advice. They can point you in the direction of a rehabilitator. They can generally point you in the right direction. And you know the number for that? 410-260-8888. Let's talk about feeding wildlife. You know, Mm -hmm. many of us like to feed birds, little birds in our backyard with Mm -hmm. bird feeders. That's about as far as you should go, right, with feeding wildlife? Yeah, I I would agree with that. And with bird feeders, it's very important also to keep them clean because we do start seeing cases of conjunctivitis spreading from bird feeders if they're not cleaned and disinfected frequently. And that's pink eye. Right. So a good idea is, is if you're seeing birds with swollen, crusty eyes at your bird feeder, just go ahead and pull that in for a couple months um, because if you already have that in your community you don't want to be spreading it to the other birds Mm -hmm. there but if the birds around your feeder look healthy I like to set a reminder in my phone just to disinfect that bird feeder uh, at least every couple weeks. And by feeding other wildlife for instance if you have a big herd of deer in your backyard and you're seeing them you're seeing it's winter there's no leaves berries Mm -hmm. or anything on the bushes or on the trees right now should you be feeding deer? I would advise against it um, because deer are excellent at finding food even in the winter. They really can fend for themselves just fine. When you gather them in large groups, uh, you have the potential to spread diseases between them. Um, And also, if you're putting out food for deer, you're often also putting out food for raccoons and other things you don't necessarily want coming to that spot. And so if we see raccoons and deer mingling over the same food pile, that has the potential to spread diseases between the two species. A posting from WJLA last year, 2019. Residents in Waldorf were shocked when a bear was spotted in their neighborhood. We see these stories every year. Montgomery Mm -hmm. County, Waldorf, Eastern Shore. We haven't seen any bear here in Anne Arundel County, but... 
bears have occasionally crossed the border into Anne Arundel County within the past five years, um, but it's not a big concern. We'll see the young uh, males ranging outside of their normal territory in Western Maryland or in Pennsylvania during the summer because they're checking out new spots. Uh, they want to range away uh, from from mom zone and see uh, what else is out there, but they frequently end up returning to either Western Maryland or Pennsylvania, especially before the breeding season starts because they start to realize there's no females in that right. area. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back on the 1430 Connection. Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. I'm in the studio with Jane Burgess, wildlife technician with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Is that your title, wildlife technician? Mm -hmm. Yeah, wildlife technician or wildlife response technician. Uh, So basically, I respond to wildlife emergencies that occur in five counties in Maryland and southern Maryland. And the strangest one you've had yet? Oh, that's a tough one. (laughs) One of the uh, craziest calls I received uh, was for two copperheads that got tangled together um, in garden netting that someone had put around their vegetable Mm. garden in an attempt to keep deer and groundhogs out. We believe it was one male and one female. They'd gotten pretty badly tangled in this garden netting. And uh, what I ended up having to do was cut out a chunk of garden netting as a whole. Um, (laughs) And I left them tangled in it, put them in a carrier, brought them to the awesome veterinarians at the Maryland Zoo. Uh Um, And they have uh, special tools to handle venomous snakes with. So they managed to uh, sedate the snakes, detangle them. One unfortunately passed away, but one was released. Some people might not like snakes. That does not give them the right to kill snakes here in Maryland. That's correct. Snakes are protected in Maryland, which means that you can't just kill every snake that you see. There is a law. Uh, Generally, all native species in Maryland are protected unless they're is a specific hunting season for that species. And there isn't for snakes. Exactly. All right. They do serve purposes. Exactly. Yeah. um, They eat a lot of bugs, um, especially the smaller snakes and the younger snakes. Um, Cockroaches, cicadas, things like that are a nice meal for them. And they also keep our rodent population under control. So if you don't have a mouse problem, if you don't have a rat problem, you might want to think a snake. (laughs) And most of the snakes you're going to see around this area, most, are Mm -hmm. pretty harmless. Mm -hmm. There are two types of venomous snakes in Maryland, yes? Mm -hmm. And one of the species you don't have to worry about seeing in Anne Arundel County, um, that's the timber rattlesnake. You're only going to see that in western Maryland. Mm -hmm. And even out there, it's becoming a pretty rare sight. The only uh, venomous snake you could run into um, in southern Maryland or in Anne Arundel County is the copperhead, which is pretty distinctive because it has um, a brown pattern along its side that looks exactly like Hershey's Kisses. And uh, when they're juvenile, they have a yellow green uh, tail. So I don't recommend grabbing any snake that you see unless you are very confident um, (laughs) that you can ID a copperhead. But that also factors into your decision not to kill it because most envenomations happen because someone is actively trying to harm a snake. And for the most part, snakes are going to leave you alone if they mm-hmm. if you leave them alone. Yeah, they have m- no motivation to interact with us. And like you said, that's the only venomous species we have around here. So mostly you're going to see rat snakes, but you could also run into garter snakes, king snakes, milk snakes. Um, and as long as you leave them alone, they're going to leave you alone. Uh, we, we have a problem worldwide with the wildlife trade and people mm-hmm. trying to catch snakes, birds, whatever have you, and mm-hmm. sell them. Mm-hmm. This is not legal either. Right. It's not legal to collect something out of the wild and profit from it. If you have information that somebody is doing this or for harming animals, again, it's Natural Resources Police, Mm -hmm. 24 hours, seven days a week. Phone number. One more time on that. Uh, That's 410-260-8888. A story that just happened in Ulster County, New York, and we see those every once in a blue moon. Someone will share a trail cam photo of a mountain lion, also known as a cougar, or 
if it was on the East Coast, it was once called the Eastern Cougar. It mm -hmm. no longer exists on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. But these photos keep getting out there and they go viral at times, as this one did, and then media shared it. Mm -hmm. According to HudsonValley1.com, an Ulster County man shared an image of what appeared to be a mountain lion. He said it was caught on game camera. It ended up being a phony photo. The last time the Eastern Cougar was in the eastern part of North America. The last records of them are believed to be in Maine in 1938 and mm -hmm. New Brunswick in Canada in 1932. They are extinct. They don't exist here anymore. They went extinct because eastern immigrants killed cougars to protect themselves and their livestock, and many states also offered a bounty to encourage the killing of cougars. We do mm -hmm. not have them in the eastern United States anymore, right? Right. At this point, there's no credible evidence that we have uh, mountain lions anywhere near Maryland. Um, we do have a resurgent bobcat population, and a lot of times those two uh, can be confused for each other. A bobcat is going to be much smaller than a mountain lion, and its tail is only going to be you know, roughly six to eight inches long. If you do spot a large cat in your yard, it would be great if you could grab a photo of it and submit it to the Department of Natural Resources, uh, because we are tracking bobcats um, at this time. There was one recently seen on trail cam bobcat mm -hmm. in dc mm -hmm. which is really exciting it is very exciting <laughs> um yeah the area it was spotted in is um fantastic so it has a lot of green space along the cno canal um so that was a really cool find um but yeah uh if you if you spot a large cat um that looks like a bobcat uh with pointy ears and a short tail please let us know about that and give us a location and a photo of it if you can all right we're going to take another short break we'll be right back on the 1430 connection Welcome back to the 1430 Connection. I'm Donna Cole. In the studio with me is Jane Burgess, wildlife technician with Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Okay, so we just talked about cougars, which we don't have here on the east coast of the United States. Wolves we also don't have on the east coast of the United States? Uh, that's correct. Uh, we do have coyotes. Coyotes. Let's mm -hmm. talk about coyotes, because every time that topic comes up, people are like, guard the kids, guard the cats, guard the dogs. Mm -hmm. We don't see a lot of interaction with coyotes and pets. We have seen some. There has been some, yeah, um, and that's part of the reason we always encourage people uh, to keep cats indoors. That's not only, of course, to protect them from coyotes, which do occasionally uh, prey on house cats. It also protects our shrews and our uh, native bird populations, so um, it's just good general advice. Um, but yeah, coyotes are not something uh, to be concerned about um, as far as, you know, uh, human interaction goes. If you uh, see a coyote that is injured or extremely mangy, you know, that's something you know, that would be concerning that you could uh, report to Department of Natural Resources. Um, but coyote sightings are, are common and it, it's nothing to be worried about. Okay. Nuisance wildlife. You call it nuisance wildlife. Mm -hmm. Including deer can be considered nuisances to property owners. You have a deer management permit, yes? I issue deer management permits. Okay. Uh, so tell me what that is. Those permits, they are for uh, farmers who are experiencing economic damage from deer herds on their crops. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it allows uh, farmers to hunt antlerless deer only on their property year round, rather than just restricting them to the hunting season. Um, it doesn't allow them to hunt at night, uh, which is a common misconception, but it just helps them encourage the deer to leave the area where they're growing important crops that are being decimated. Okay, so a community that is concerned about their beautiful plantings, not the same. Right. Yeah, it's a lot different uh, when you're outside of a rural area. If you're in more of a suburban area, that's got to be a more controlled situation with hunting. So that's not something I'm personally involved in, right. um, is community deer management. Speaking of which, going back to that eastern cougar and why it went extinct, one of the uh, reasons that the Fish and Wildlife Service said the white-tailed deer, the primary prey of the cougar, was nearly extinct in eastern America by the late 1800s, which is interesting mm -hmm. to me. I did not know that. They are actually a very reasonable nuisance problem in Maryland uh, because they only really started making a strong comeback in the late 1900s. So now they're everywhere, you know, so much that they're a frequent problem on roads where people are hitting them. But that has not been the case for very long. Okay, fawns. 
we're going to start seeing fawn snapping sometime mm-hmm. in the spring. Mm-hmm. That's perfectly normal. Mom does what? Mom's going to leave them alone for up to 12 hours a day, um, especially when they're first born. Uh, she's going to hide them in uh, in a good spot, usually curled up in tall grass, because uh, they even though we don't have the mountain lions around, they still have the instinct of not wanting to draw predators uh, to the fawn, uh, because the fawn is basically scentless, whereas her scent will attract predators. Um, so if you see a fawn uh, curled up alone. Don't interfere with it. There's no need to worry about it. Mom is going to come back. However, one situation where you need to be concerned is if the fawn is, you know, bleeding, if it looks like it has a major injury, if it has a big cloud of flies buzzing around it, or if it's been walking around for several hours making crying noises, you know, that might require some interference from wildlife rehabilitators because that fawn may have been orphaned at that point. Um, But if it's calm, curled up, alone, just leave it alone. <laughs> nature doing what nature does. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to back to the deer question. Lead, lead has become a problem. Lead is a problem. Lead was banned f- from gasoline and from paint, but it w- has not been banned from ammunition. And lead can cause issues for wildlife, yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, lead and ammunition and also in fishing weights, um, especially when it comes to our ospreys and bald eagles who eat a lot of fish. It can be more expensive to find alternatives to those lead fishing weights and lead ammunition. But it's a great idea if you're worried about your impact on our local wildlife to try to move away from lead. Because if an eagle or an osprey, or sometimes even a vulture, ingests a very tiny amount of lead, it can kill them. And it's been, recent studies I've seen have shown that lead ammo can break up into tiny invisible particles in in venison, mm-hmm. which are invisible to the human eye, but that venison is going to homes to be eaten, consumed, mm-hmm. which is a little concerning. Right. Yeah. Um, it's. I'm not a doctor, so I can't really speak as much to the human impacts of consuming lead and venison. Um, it hasn't been a widespread problem where we've been seeing families of hunters be strongly affected, yeah. um, but it's definitely something to consider. All right. What have I missed? What do you want to make clear to our audience that with uh, spring coming up and keeping our Maryland natural resources safe? I like to speak to some of our uh, tiniest hopping uh, native wildlife, uh, especially with, you know, leap day just passing. Um, A lot of people will see a nest of bunnies in their yard, uh, baby eastern cottontail rabbits this time of year. And it's the same situation with the fawns where because uh, the bunnies have been left alone for a very long period of time, they think they're orphaned. But there's a very simple trick to tell if the bunnies are actually orphaned or not. You can make a tic-tac-toe pattern with yarn on top of the nest. And when mom comes back, she's going to scrabble that out of the way. She's going to destroy the pattern to get to her babies. So if that pattern goes undisturbed for a whole day, you know those babies might be orphaned. Um, But if the yarn gets disturbed, you know mom's taking care of them. Great advice. One other question. We recently saw, not in this area, but an article that went viral about a hawk taking a small dog. And then I saw a wildlife rehab facility say no. A hawk doesn't take mm-hmm. a dog this size. Your thoughts on that? Uh, I haven't seen that video exactly, um, but they're generally not going to go after anything that they uh, can't lift, something that's heavier than them. So you would certainly want to keep an eye on your chickens mm-hmm. around a hawk, <laughs> um, also around our bald eagles. But uh, cats and dogs, uh, there's there's no record of, of them being lifted off by hawks or owls. Jane, I can't thank you enough for doing what you do and for <laughs> Thanks, being here I today. I appreciate that. <laughs> this is Donna Cole on the 1430 Connection. We'll see you next week.